So, as we were talking about last time, um, I want to do World War II differently than we've done normal units. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to give you like step by step, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Rather, I want more of a, a broader discussion about the ethics of war, the morality of it, what is right, what is wrong, what can be done, what should be done, what shouldn't be done, those kind of things. And part of the reason is, are these questions only particular to World War II? No. no. Unfortunately, we still have to answer these questions every single day. Maybe someday we won't have to answer these questions, but that's probably pie in the sky thinking. Um, so, this PowerPoint presentation that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at several examples of potential war crimes. I'm going to leave it up to you guys to decide whether or not the actions that we're going to discuss are war crimes. But first, we really need to you know, define our terms. So let's start with some quick and easy definitions. An atrocity, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is an extremely wicked or cruel act typically one involving physical violence or injury. That is what we call an atrocity. <coughs> Connected to it, a war crime is an action carried out during the conduct of a war that violates accepted international rules of war. Uh, there, have been, there have been very many um, treaties and, and, and conventions that have been held between the various countries saying, okay, we're going to kill each other, but we're going to do so in a civilized manner, which is a little bit ironic. But there are certain actions that the international community have come together and they have said, these things are not allowed to be done at all. And if, if they are done, there are consequences. For instance, the United States last year, uh, US, U.S. Army court-martialed someone for a war crime. He committed a war crime in Afghanistan, and they, they punished him. In The Hague, they sent people to, to prison for things that happened like 20 years ago, like generals in, from uh, Bosnia and Serbia and Rwanda, you know, various things like that, places like that. So we kind of started this conversation. Jack gave us an example of pla use of plastic explosives is no longer permitted. What other things can we think of that are no, you're not allowed to do them? Yeah? Aren't you not allowed to loot? You're not allowed to loot. No looting. So if, you, if your army takes a city, you're not allowed to just kick in the door to the bank and take everything. Or you're not allowed to find the rich people and, and steal everything from their houses. Or if you find a dead body, you're not allowed to take his wallet. That would be considered a war crime. Anyone else? I saw another hand over here. Yeah? Chemical weapons. Chemical weapons. Phosgene, chlorine, mustard. Most of the countries in the world have decided we're not allowed to use chemical weapons. That includes, by the way, tear gas. So the US Army in Afghanistan, it would be a war crime if they used tear gas against the Taliban. But if you use them against protesters, that's okay. <laughs> so they use the chemical weapons, yeah. The mistreatment of uh, prisoners of war. Mistreatment of prisoners of war. You're not allowed to torture them. You're not allowed to starve them. You're not allowed to use them as slave labor. They have rights. You can't just execute them for no reason. Now, that being said, if a POW like hops the fence and starts running for it, are you allowed to shoot them then? Yes, because they're, they're escaping. 
They're a prisoner. <coughs> so that would be acceptable under the laws of war. Any others? Who else are we not allowed to mistreat or kill? Citizens. Can I clarify? Civilians. Civilians. You're not allowed to intentionally target civilians. I feel like I always spell that word wrong. But that's okay. Any others? There's a lot around prisoners. For instance, you're not allowed to fake surrender. That's, that's something that is not OK. That was something the Japanese would do, is they would fake surrender, and then the Marines would come up and try to take them, and then they would just kill the Marines. Like, that's, that's not OK. White flag means something. You're not allowed to. <coughs> You're not allowed to destroy intentionally hospitals, schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, other places of worship. So intentionally destroy hospitals, schools, churches, Etc. <coughs> On the flip side, are you allowed to put <coughs> put soldiers in those places? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Oh, really? Because if you put soldiers in a hospital, what does that turn that hospital into? Um, well, a target. It turns it into a target. <coughs> That's something that, for instance, uh, Hezbollah does. They, have, they store ammunition. <coughs> they store rockets in the basements of schools. <coughs> so when the, if the IDF hits the school, they're like, oh my gosh, you committed a war crime. Well, Hezbollah, you did it first. OK, whatever. But you're not allowed to station ammo, weapons, soldiers in these places. Oftentimes, that's referred to as using civilians as a human shield. Any other? I think this is a pretty good list. We'll probably find some others as we continue going. And I'll, pro I'll probably think of some like an hour from now. That always happens to me. Like, oh, that one. Oh, well. Um, now, this next one is pretty lengthy. You don't necessarily have to write it down. Maybe just hit some of, the, some of the highlights. But this is the official definition of a war crime from the Fourth Geneva Convention. So this was signed immediately after World War II, or at least a few years after World War II. <laughs> so a war crime, according to this convention, is the willful killing, torture, or inhuman treatment, including willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, unlawful deportation or transfer, or unlawful confinement of a protected person, compelling a protected person to serve in the forces of a hostile power, or willfully depriving a protected person of the rights of fair and regular trial, taking of hostages, and extensive destruction and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully and wantonly. Anyone know what wantonly means? That's Carelessly. a vocab word. Carelessly, just whatever, <laughs> just do whatever. That's a vocab word to remember. So again, I know this is long. You don't necessarily have to write it all down. Maybe just some of the highlights. But these are the definitions that we are going to be working with as we continue forward. Now I should note that 1949 was the fourth Geneva Convention. So this is to indicate that there have been these discussions about what is and what is not a war crime well before World War II. 
So for instance, there are the Hague Conventions that deal with prisoners of war. There was one in 1899 and 1907. The first Geneva Convention was in 1864, the second in 1906, the third in 1929, also dealing with the prisoners of war. There's the Geneva Naval Conference in 1925. The Geneva Protocol in 1925 banned the poison, poison gas. There are the Leipzig Trials in 1921. And of course, we have the kellogg briand Pact in 1929. That one's funny to me, because that one was uh, countries got together, and they said, war is now illegal. How did that go? Not well. <laughs> Good attempt. Gold star for trying. Um, the point is, though, that we have all of these previous conventions that many, many countries have signed. So let's get a list going. There were two sides to World War II. What was one of the sides called? Allies. Allies. The other? Axis The Axis. Who was on the Allied team? U.S. Britain. Yeah. U.S., U.K., U.S.S.R., <laughs> France. <coughs> so they kind of get a participation trophy. Um, any other? So those are kind of the major ones. There's also Mexico. Mexico technically declared war on Germany. Uh, Poland, <laughs> though they were <laughs> conquered. Um, What's that China? Mean? China? Yeah, China is a major player. China, Vietnam, they were fighting against the Japanese. Brazil technically declared war. They were primarily sending like supplies and things like that. Um, can I just put etc.? If I remember, there was like 84 countries. They were all part of the Allies. Most of them didn't do the heavy lifting. It was mostly these top four or these top three, I should say, that did the heavy lifting. Oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. So, there's the Allied team. Axis team, who's on that team? Germany. Germany, Germany Italy, the Empire of the Rising Sun, also known as? Japan. 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 Someone said Romania. I remember Bulgaria also. Well, I'm iffy on that one. Can I just put etc.? So the big three are right here. So we got our teams. Which of these countries did not sign these human rights treaties, these war crime <coughs> treaties? Anyone want to take a guess which ones did not sign? Yeah. Japan signed. The U.S. The U.S. US signed. The U.S.S.R. because it's technically a new country. The U.S.S.R. did not sign. Partic specifically, they were not part of the, one of the Geneva Conventions around prisoners of war, which is why the Nazis said, well, they didn't sign it, so we can just do whatever we want with them. <coughs> Any others? Italy. Italy signed. I'll stop you there. All of them signed, except the USSR. And the USSR only didn't sign that one treaty. So all of these countries have signed certain agreements before this war started, and they are fully aware of what is and what is not a war crime. Now let's see how well they keep the, those promises. Before we continue, any questions? All right. Now, the way that this PowerPoint presentation is structured, it goes in sequential order or chrono chronological order. So we're, we're going to go with one of the earliest and most significant <coughs> ones, and then we're going to go all the way to 1945. All right? Our first one up is known as The Rape of Nanking.
The rape of Nanking occurred between December of 1937 and January of 1938. What's happening in China? They're being invaded by the Japanese. The Japanese are invading. They're kicking them right in the teeth. And Nanking happens to be the capital of China at the time, though it, it relocates quite often doesn't it? <laughs> but at this moment, Nanking is the capital. And Japan is basically wiping the floor with the Chinese. The Chinese army is losing very, very badly. They are retreating very often. But Nanking, or Nanjing, is a very, very important city for the reasons that we just discussed. So the Chinese, the Chinese army tries to hold the Japanese there. And they try to hold them on top of this hill, basically. However, the Japanese surround them, and then they work their way up to the top of the hill, and they basically wipe out every Chinese soldier that's defending <coughs> Nanking. So does Nanking have anyone protecting them, though? No. There's just Nanking and the Imperial Army. The Imperial Army starts entering Nanking, starts taking the city, and in the process of taking the city, the Imperial Army massacres somewhere between 30,000 and 100,000 Chinese civilians. On top of that, they refuse to take prisoners of Chinese soldiers. That itself is a war crime. You can't just shoot them if they're trying to surrender. They're just running rampant through the city. Also, this is being encouraged by officers. Partly as, hey, you fought really well, army. Here, have this city and just do whatever you want. So there's looting, there's uh, stealing of all kinds, money is being stolen all over the place. The Japanese, Japanese soldiers are just killing civilians wantonly. They're all, of course, mistreating prisoners of war. That goes back to Japan's sense of Bushido culture of you should never, ever, ever surrender. And if you do surrender, you're less than human. So naturally, we should mistreat the prisoners of war because they dishonored themselves. There is rampant looting and rape, all of it encouraged by the officers of the army. And that part is particularly important. Officers are there in order to maintain discipline and maintain control. The fact that the officers are encouraging the privates and the corporals and the sergeants to do these things demonstrates, um, how to say it, uh, like a, a perverse sense of Oh, how to say it. It demonstrates a problem with the chain of command. In fact, some people have made the argument that these orders went all the way up to the emperor's son. Because he was technically in charge of this army when this was going on. You know, the, the fish rots from the head down. While all of this was going on, at least 20,000 women were forcibly raped against their will, all within a six-week period. Part of the reason that we know so much about this is that Nanking you know, was the capital, so there was a lot of foreigners. There was a lot of British citizens and Americans and Germans. In fact, the German, the German ambassador that was there helps to organize a safety zone for, hey, uh, civilians, get to this area. Which is a little ironic, because he was a hardcore Nazi. So it's weird to say, like, this hardcore Nazi was a hero in this particular situation. On top of this, there were two officers in the Japanese army that had, they had themselves a contest. They wanted to see who could get 100 heads first. So who could cut off 100 people's heads first? 
What's interesting about this contest is that it was highly publicized. It was publicized in the Nippon Times, which is a Japanese newspaper equivalent to the New York Times. <coughs> in their reporting, the Nippon Times was very supportive <coughs> of this fun game. Can you imagine if the New York Times ran positive stories about American soldiers cutting, cutting off the heads of Afghans and Iraqis? And to see who could get a hundred of them first? So these two officers, they're having this contest, and they were both at that battle on top of the hill, where they were on different sides of the hill. And I think, if I remember correctly, at the, at the end of the contest, um, they both hit their quota during that battle. Uh, one of them had 104, and another had 102. So it was very close. But you'll remember, the contest was to see who could get to 100 first, not to see who could get more. There's 100 first. And could they tell who got that first? No. So this officers, in a gentlemanly contest, decided to reset, because it would only be fair. So let's try for another 100 heads each. I have to emphasize, this was publicized to the Japanese public in the Nippon Times, positively. Those two officers, after the war was over, were hanged for what they did. But it wasn't just the officers doing these kind of things. It was also the, the, the privates and the corporals. Um, back in the day, uh, it was actually kind of cool. You could take a picture of something. And then there were certain companies that could turn that picture into a postcard. And you could send that postcard home. So you could make your own postcards. Which is, I'm sorry, a postcard is a little piece of paper that <laughs> has a picture on it. It's like a tweet, but it takes longer to get where it goes. Um, anyway, so you can actually make your own postcards, which I think is a little cool. The Japanese soldiers, while they are doing all of this, are making their own postcards to send home. So you'd have a squad of maybe like 10 guys, and one of them would have a camera, and they would take pictures of each other, bayonetting Chinese soldiers and Chinese civilians, take that as a picture, turn that into a postcard, send it home, wish you were here, XOXO. <laughs> their mom would get it in Japan, like, oh my gosh, look. Hero has uh, sent us a postcard, and he's having such a wonderful time in China. Here's the question. Is this a war crime? Come on. Is it a war crime? Why? Mistreating civilians. They're mistreating civilians. They're murdering <laughs> civilians. They're intentionally targeting them. Why else is it a war crime? Mistreating prisoners. They're mistreating prisoners. They're not allowing people to surrender. Why else? They're looting. They're wantonly like destroying everything. They're just destroying everything. And there's okay. another big one. It's connected to intentionally targeting civilians. It's in the name. It's a rape. Rape. Twenty thousand women. Raped. So I think, are we have a consensus that this is a war crime? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Of course, did the world, sorry, hold on. The world was watching as all of this was happening, and people were horrified. Oh my god. Japan, what are you doing? So much so that the US gave Japan an ultimatum. If you do not get out of China, we're going to cut off your oil. At the time, Japan was getting 80% of its oil from the United States. Why is oil important? You need it for vehicles and boats. You need it for vehicles, boats, tanks, planes. The Navy of Japan estimated that if the US cut them off, they only had enough oil in reserve for two years. Can Japan maintain its empire if that happens? No. And do they want to give up their empire? No. So they're kind of stuck in this position of, well, either we back down and we look weak and we lose everything that we got, or we keep going and the US cuts us off. 
Or there's a third alternative. What's the third alternative? You keep going and then you take the oil from the places. You keep going, you take the oil. The Japanese were planning, oh my gosh, that's so tight over here. There are oil fields in Indonesia that are controlled by the Dutch. The Dutch, of course, are friends of the United States. The Japanese plans to seize these oil fields so that way they wouldn't be reliant on another country. However, if they did that, how would the United States respond? War. war. That would be an act of war. And of course, you know, there's the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii. That is a major strategic threat. So naturally, what does Japan do? Um, Where do they bomb? Uh, Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor yeah. This is the reason why Pearl Harbor happened, December 7th, <coughs> 1941. Any questions? Next up, we have the Kachin Forest Massacre. It's pronounced Kachin, it's not Katin, or Katin, Kachin. So for a little bit of context, we've already touched on this a little bit, but we're going to expand on it just as a smidge. September 1939, Poland is invaded by both the Nazis and the Soviets. That's something that we should never, ever, ever forget. The Nazis and the Soviets agree that we're going to split Poland in half. Germany gets the western half, Russia gets the eastern half. I have a series of pictures that are just fascinating, especially in the context of what happens later. This picture is of a Russian officer and a German officer meeting in the middle after defeating Poland and they're shaking hands. Hey, good job. <coughs> we did it. We kicked Poland in the butt. Why is that a little ironic? Because they're going to be fighting. They're going to engage in one of the bloodiest wars ever with each other. Up top with these horses, that is the joint Nazi and Soviet victory parade in Warsaw. They had a parade together. Now, is USSR, are they, are they, do they just want to keep this territory temporarily? No. no. How long do they want to keep it? Forever. Forever. They want it permanently. They want to permanently integrate Eastern Poland into the Soviet Union. And of course, the Russians try to portray this in a positive way. We're here to help you, Poland. We're here to bring you towards the glories of socialism and communism. And Poland says, I don't really want that. Too bad. So let's imagine, put yourself in the shoes of an evil dictator. If you wanted to permanently integrate a territory, what might you do? Who might you? Who might be a threat to you? People that don't want that to happen. Well, true, but who might, might not want that to happen? The government. So the leaders, the gov government leaders, <coughs> mayors, governors, the president of Poland. Do you think he keeps his office? <laughs> no. Those people, get rid of them. Arrest them. Who else? Who else might be a threat? Who might, who might stir up trouble in the population? The Polish military? The military, especially. You know, people who are trained to use weapons. Specifically, though, officers are a problem. Because, you know, they're not conscripted. They're their career. They have leadership skills. They know how to use weapons. They know about strategy and tactics might be a big problem. Let's add on intellectuals. So university professors that don't toe the line, high school teachers that don't toe the line might be targeted for this. And of course, just anyone that's a dissident. So the Soviets and the Nazis did the same thing. 
So I don't, I don't want to put this only on the Soviets. They start going and they arrest professors and they arrest mayors and they start, you know, grabbing all these people and either torturing them or killing them or forcing them otherwise to go along with what they're doing. But for our story, we're going to be looking at the military. This event happens in the spring of 1940. I think, yes, I think it's on the calendar for the, for the history and cinema. There's a movie called Kachin. I watched that in college and it deeply depressed me. Almost made me want to quit being a history major. It was so depressing. Um, so the, night, the spring of 1940, the NKVD, which is the secret police. So they were the Cheka. Now they're the NKVD. Eventually they're going to be the KGB. They take 22,000 Polish prisoners of war into the forest of Kachin, which is in eastern Poland, western Ukraine. They take them by truckload, basically, one by one. Their hands are bound by, behind them. Some of them have bags over their heads. They use tractors to dig out huge pits in the forest. When they got to their locations, they forced them onto their knees and shot them, each and every one of them, with one round in the head, right in the back, every single one. Then, of course, they threw the bodies into the pits and buried them. There are mass graves for these men. And also, we have to note that these were all officers. The Soviets didn't bother with the privates and the corporals, because those were probably just draftees. We want to target the people that might actually be nationalist leaders. Of course, we have these pictures. Uh, sorry, hold on. Will the Russian, what, do the Russians want people to know about this? No. no. That's why they did it far away in the forest, and they never told the families about, hey, your dad was a POW. Huh, I don't know what happened to him. Sorry, his letters just won't go through. I don't know why. So they don't want this to, ha just this to be discovered. But we have pictures. So clearly, it was discovered, right? Anyone want to take a guess who discovered them? The Nazis. The Nazis. The Germans, when they start Operation Barbarossa and they invade the Soviet Union, they march right through this forest. And Nazi soldiers start digging up these mass graves. And the Nazis are like, oh my gosh, hey world, the Soviet Union killed 20,000 POWs. And the Soviet Union says, no we didn't. That was the Nazis. The Nazis did that. So the Soviets lie about what happened. That wasn't us. That was the Nazis. And of course, who's the world going to believe? Soviets. I mean, let's to be fair, if I told you the Nazis killed 20,000 people in a forest, would that be a surprising thing? No, that would not be shocking. So, I mean, if it fits, it's just not true. So the U.S., the UK, France, all the allied countries, they believe what the Soviets said. Yeah, they, it was totally the Nazis that did it. <coughs> Later on, when, when the Cold War starts, people start to reevaluate. Like, hmm, maybe the Soviets did lie about that. And later on, when Poland gets liberated by the Soviet Union, they try to maintain that lie. And so they go after the, P the families of those POWs. They find them like, so you remember that your father was killed by the Nazis, right? No, I, I remember you did that. Are you sure that you remember it that way, comrade? Are you really sure? And what did they do if they didn't comply? They could be tortured. They could be executed. They could be arrested. There was an example of one woman she was, and they, they, they got people to go on the radio and lie for them. 
They forced these families to go on to radio broadcasts and say, yeah, the Nazis killed my father. The Nazis killed my husband. And there was one poor woman, she refused to do it. Like, I'm not going to lie for you. And the Soviets, as a punishment, raped her for that. They maintained this lie. So it happens in 1940. It's discovered in 1941, 42. And they maintain this lie until 1992. The Russians do not admit to what they did until after the Soviet Union collapsed. Finally, in 1992, they, yeah, yeah, that was us. Sorry, I guess. And so the Allies end up believing the Soviets for a while. But of course, by the time the Cold War starts, everyone is questioning it. Question, is this a war crime? Yes. Why? Mistreatment of POWs. Mistreatment of POWs. Murder. And then we can add, to, this is a little arguable, but we can add to that mistreatment of civilians as well. <coughs> All right, any questions? Yeah. Oh, like, hey, sorry, we believe the lie. I don't think so. I think I think Germany had a lot more to apologize for <laughs> than, than that little one. Um, speaking of which, um, most of these in that we're going to be talking about are from Japan, the U.S., and the USSR. But Germany gets their entire own PowerPoint presentation all to themselves. Wow. All right, last call. Yeah. What is the statue? That is a statue commemorating, remembering the, the Cochin Forest Massacre. It's a POW being bayoneted. <coughs> All right. If that's it, I think we are done for the day. Oh, no.